from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Patrick. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Veterans History Project of the American Folklife Center, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest Benjamin A. Botkin lecture in an ongoing series sponsored by the American Folklife Center. The Veterans History Project, which I say is a part of the American Folklife Center, is very pleased to be a co-host for today's events. The Botkin series allows us to interact with scholars in folklife and cultural heritage while building the collections here at the American Folklife Center. The lectures are an important acquisitions project as they are videotaped to become part of the permanent collections of the center and they are then posted on, as webcast on the LC website. For those of you who don't know what the Veterans History Project is, we are a congressionally mandated effort to collect, preserve, and make accessible the wartime memories of America's veterans. We've been doing this since 2000 and are now the largest oral history project in American history. Today, I trust you will see how veteran stories can illuminate the topic that's under the discussion, dog tags. Hopefully, you will see how very personal these items can be and the emotions they can create. Uh, one administrative announcement, since this presentation is being taped for posting on the web, to ensure the best production value now, now would be an excellent time to turn off your electronic devices. <laughs> I see even, me. even you. However, I have one, uh, one caveat to this. We did ask attendees to this lecture to wear their dog tags. And there's a distinctive sound that dog tags make. And I hope we can capture this somewhere on the tape, okay? <laughs> Today I have the honor of introducing Jennifer Kukolo, who will be in introducing us to her book, Dog Tags, The History, Personal Stories, Cultural Impact, and Future of Military Identification. Ginger has a personal connection to the military. She is married to a career infantryman with over 32 years of active duty service, and we're very pleased to have him with us today, Yay. Major General Tony Kukolo. <laughs> his dog tags have forever been a part of his extended life. Ginger is a Native, Navy daughter, an Army daughter-in-law and sister, and a Marine niece of servicemen <laughs> but her years as the spouse of an Army soldier have involved, us, involved her in the lives of many other servicemen and women. Her book was published in July 2011. It was chosen as a finalist in the history category of the United States of America Best Books 2011 Awards. She has done numerous radio and TV spots, written articles, and been published in a number of magazines regarding this topic. Ginger holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Texas at Austin, Texas, and a Master's of Science in Community Health Administration and Wellness Promotion from California College for Health Sciences. She manages five websites to include dogtaghistory.com. I would also say that we are very delighted to have Ginger's mother here, Yay. Ray Virginia Allen. Mm. She herself is a noted cultural historian, author, and lecturer specializing in American studies. But beyond that, uh, beyond that she is no stranger to the Library of Congress or the American Folklife Center, because in 1975, she was appointed to serve as a founding trustee of the American Folklife Center, and we're delighted to have you here today. Uh, I will say that uh, after this uh, uh, presentation, we have materials up here for you to take a look at. The book that we'll be talking about will be on sale out front, and uh, Ginger has uh, offered to sign those. So without any further ado, let me introduce Ginger Kukolo. I wouldn't be here if it were not for Jennifer Cutting. Is Jennifer here? No, she's, she's not. not she's, she's ill this week. Well, please thank her for me because um, it was uh, through a far-reaching email that I sent a note to the Folklife Center and asking them about possibly being able to discuss the dog tag book. And through her uh, kindness, I was able to meet, uh, of course, Dr. Nancy Gross. Uh, Peggy Bulger and Bob Patrick um, and many others 
and I want to thank them. And I'm not naive enough to think that it is just through my email there. It is through my mother. So thank you, Mom, um, <laughs> for laying the groundwork for there, because I selfishly used your name in that email. Um, I'm honored not only to be a part of the Botkin Lecture Series um, and hosted, of course, by the Folk Life Center um, and by the Veterans History Project under the Library of Congress. I can die now. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, we will get through this and be fine. It wants to keep clicking on me. I'm not even going to touch the other ones for that. Okay. I'd like to take you into my world, the world of the American military service member. This includes Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Active and Reserve, and the National Guard, and of course, their military family members. And because I am a spouse of an active duty soldier, I must include extended families. And nowadays, that means by birth, by marriage, and by any way you can think of, extended is extended. While I cannot simulate the experiences, challenges, opportunities, or complexities of this life, let me try and immerse you by touching your senses and emotions with which a small metal object brings to my world of the military family. This is about military personal identification and that small object so many people call the dog tag. Let's begin by addressing its original intent. Identification of soldiers predates America. The most common known story is of Spartan soldiers who carried a shield and they were to come home with it or be brought home on it. Each soldier had very different designs on their shields, which were often passed through generations. Identifying the Spartan soldier who fought with that shield gave the armor a special meaning and purpose. Now what could that connection to identity be that makes it so personal? We all want to be connected to things we know and love, and for most, what could be more personal and heartbreaking than the thought of losing a loved one and not knowing how we lost them or where they might be? There is a human aspect of innate existence and fear of facing death. I do not want to be forgotten. I will not be unknown. This fear is compelling not only in validating the emotional aspect, but also in acknowledging the practical aspect. Having no finality to a person's whereabouts leads to an inability for closure, closure for paperwork, closure for financial arrangements, closure for well-being. Families are placed in a state of limbo. Identification has many aspects. But the significance of identification in the regard to the dog tag is not the same as identification for military burial. It was during the Civil War that attention, time, and money was spent on making sure we took the proper respect to bury those we serve, who served and sacrificed for their nation. That is not the meaning addressed here. To be honored and buried might bring comfort to that to the thought of being left on an open field, but it does not comfort the person who is concerned about being unidentified. Identification for the military makes the burial process easier if dog tags are worn and recovered. A nameless body does not connect the soul that inhabited it, but a name and its identifying information make a connection to that human body. Consequently, it took the effect of war on American soul, soil to put that desire into actua actuality. Let me lead you to a place in time where this item became important to us in America. Here is its historical setting. This is a fictional story that is told by my husband, Tony Cucolo, regarding the first historical record of higher command requesting personal identification.
Major General George Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac, told his soldiers to write their names coming up, on a piece of paper at the Battle of Cold Harbor, 1864, and pin it to themselves. A thick cloud of dust surrounded Company H and the 112th Regiment of New York Volunteers. They moved forward, shoulder to shoulder, each man quiet in his own thoughts. The dust reeked with the stench of dead men, dead horses, and it floated like a morbid veil, allowing them only to see those marching to the left and the right of them. Two lifelong friends, Albert Jones and John Freeman, marched together, knowing all too well what waited for them amidst this shroud. Within moments, a shot and shell ripped through the air, and their adrenaline pumped. Let her rip, someone yelled. In unison, those up and down the line yelled, Hurrah! Jones and Freeman, still shoulder to shoulder, picked up their pace over an uneven and broken ground. They heard muffled curses as Benny stumbled but kept going. These men moving forward with them were like family, and all took pride in the way Company H continued to fight, even when exhausted. Their senses in overdrive, they never felt more alive. In the near distance, the unmistakable sound of a rebel yell and bursts of guns and mortars. John heard a shell burst near him and looked left to see how the fall back was. Albert Freeman yelled and dropped back, kneeling beside his friend. Many balls whizzed by him. John, I'm all right, Jones said with a strange calm. Get back to the line. Blood spurted from Jones's neck, and Freeman knew he would not be all right. Freeman yelled Sergeant Keyes. Toe the mark. He's somebody else's darling now. Freeman knew what the company sergeant wanted him to do, but he couldn't leave his lifelong friend alone to die. He pulled a scarf from his own neck and wrapped it around Jones's throat to try and stop the bleeding. Jones could barely speak. Freeman saw him reaching for his chest. It's there, Albert. It's there, Freeman told him as he pulled Jones's arm across his chest so his hand could feel the paper that had his name and regiment written before the battle so if he fell, he would not be unknown. When Freeman let go, Jones's arm slid back down and his life left his body. A sense of duty got Freeman back to his feet, and he jogged forward to rejoin Company H. He was glad they had written their names on a piece of paper and pinned it to their blouses. He would come back for Albert and make sure his family knew how he died. But as he ran, he instinctively felt for his own piece of paper, found it, and was reassured of not being lost and forgotten. He knew too well he could be next. During our Civil War, it was hardened soldiers who were sickened by the inability to identify and bury those they fought so hard beside. They knew family members would want to know their loved ones left on the battlefield with exposed limb and body parts sticking up from the ground would not be left there. Or worse, they didn't want them to think about being eaten by hungry animals that ravaged them. There were organizations that tried to help with identification. Service members who were unable to identify themselves for whatever reason did such things like enlisting under false names or deserting their units. This made correct identification difficult. There is also record of enlistments to gain access to bounty money and enlistments of soldiers wanting to become another person and leave their past behind. Whatever caused the lack of ability to identify soldiers, this led to a higher level of disappointment for family members. Personal items could be identifiers, and many of the wealthier individuals had such items engraved. Variations included medallions, watches, combs, bracelets, neck ornaments, and rings adorned with their names and possibly their hometowns or units. Basically, anything that could be engraved or scratched upon was an identifier. Offering more specific identification items, Harper's Weekly offered discs for sale in their publication of Harper's Weekly. As you can see in the smaller print, there are soldiers' pins, which could be mail-ordered. Sutlers and campsite traveler and traveling salesmen made discs tags and coins with a soldier's name and unit for them if they wanted. Sutlers might take a coin or something similar the soldier had, flatten it, smooth it out, and then imprint the information. 
knowing young boys would be left unknown on the battlefield, might have been the hardest thing for family members to comprehend. Every aspect of soldiering comes alive in their letters and diaries. The stench of spoiled meat, the deafening sound of cannons, the sight of main bodies, and the randomness and anonymity of deaths. These were the images soldiers were left with and thus supported the importance of identification and burial. By 1862, frustrated citizens were asking why a nation of shopkeepers could keep track of its parcel, but not its soldiers. Interesting enough, in May of 1862, a gentleman by the name of John Kennedy, no relation to our president, sent a letter to our Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, offering to pay for the identification disk for all Union soldiers. For some, for some unknown reason, this offering was declined. Thus, we were left with a variety of ways that our service members identified themselves. There was nothing formal about it from our government until the Spanish-American War. Many of the dead during the Spanish-American War were buried in Cuba or Puerto Rico. The military sought direction of identification and death services with the establishment of two organizations. They operated out of the Philippines, excuse me, out of the Philippines with similar and yet different tasks. It would take a very determined and committed graves registration organization to record and identify the remains of those buried. It is also important to note that this same organization was to disinter the war dead and bring them back to American soil for reinterment. The wisdom gained from concisely coordinating death, burial, and grave registration was the way to successfully identify remains. The U.S. Army put this into practice during the Spanish-American War. One of the organizations was led by D.H. Rhodes, Chief of the Burial Corps. The other unit was the United States Army Morgue and Office of Identification established by Chaplain Charles E. Pierce. It was Chaplain Pierce who believed the identity of war dead should be practiced on a more scientific basis. Both organizations were effective in improving our overall ability to collect, identify, and bury remains. However, it was Chaplain Pierce who believed the identity of war dead should be practiced on a more scientific basis. He suggested a central collection agency where mortuary records would be gathered and more importantly, the addition of identity disc in the combat field kit. In December of 1906, the Army officially authorized an identification tag as part of the uniform to be kept in possession of the soldier when not in uniform. This is the first time the War Department does so officially. In 1913, the Army instated its first regulation regarding the personal identification tag. It required that tags were, re were required as part of the field kit. In August 1917, the Quartermaster General was to request a Graves Registration Service for the Quartermaster Corps during the period of the existing emergency, World War I. Chaplain Pierce was in charge of this unit. Through these trained and dedicated individuals, they applied a more scientific approach to identification and burial. It was during World War I that the thought of burying the soldiers where they fell became important to many family members, even if on foreign soil. When Teddy Roosevelt's son, Lieutenant Quentin Rez Roosevelt, was killed, he requested that where the tree falls, let it lie. 30,000 Americans from this war are buried in one of eight cemeteries in Europe, while 47,000 were returned to the United States. The identification tags, which became mandatory for all services in 1917, became a major influence in identification process during that time. As before, after World War I, the push for ID tags subsided. It was popularly believed that ID tags were only needed during combat. 
In the Bureau of Naval Personnel Manual, 1925, it stated that in time of war or other emergency, or when directed by competent authority, individual identification tags shall be prepared and worn by all persons in the Naval Service suspended from the neck or from the wrist on cotton sleeve Monel wire. Monel metal chain could be used at the individual's expense. The, inf the information remained the same on the tags as during World War I. Identification tags, in general, remained the same up until World War II, and it was during this time that the ID tags became known more commonly as the dog tags. In World War II, the tag began to, excuse me, began to change. Many GIs wore them with metal chains instead of the cloth tie around their necks. Because of the metal, crocheted or leather bags were often made to keep them silent. The metal chain and tags lent itself to be most like collars with a tag on them. This photo is a stock photo issued for the proper way to identif wear identification tags during the time. The reason I know the name of the individual in this photo is one of the unusual re stories I received during my research. Let me share the story his son told me about it with you. I was watching one of my favorite TV programs on PBS. They were focused on how during and after the Civil War, how difficult it was identifying the dead left on the battlefield. They went on to describe the World War I effort to have the round aluminum tag and followed up with photos of them with the photo of my dad. It was a very emotional experience for me. Anyway, my curiosity got the best of me. I googled history of the dog tag and was directed to your website. There was my dad's photo prominently displayed on your site with a citation from the Quartermaster Museum, Fort Lee. The GI in the photo is my father, David J. Hyslop, Jr. of Geneva, Ohio. At the time, early 1942, he was assigned to the Quartermaster Corps, a PFC at the time, and was, with, and was finishing commissioned officer training school. Do not know whether Dad volunteered for that photo or whether he was randomly volunteered <laughs> by higher authority. In any event, he saved a copy of the newspaper where this photo appeared in 1942. It is contained in his World War II scrapbook, which the family still has. Dad served in the China, Burma, India Theater of Operations and was in the first convoy of supplies that traveled over the storied Burma Road into China. He survived the war and was a captain when he was discharged. He died in 1989. As you can probably determine in the photo, Dad was not happy about being photographed <laughs> at the time. He had only been recently married to my mother. He felt if the photo was released openly, he was not given time to properly dress groom for the photo op. The authorities assured him at the time the photo would only show him from the shoulders down, no facial photo. When the photo showed up in the media, he was quite upset. So now to have that photo on a nationwide televised program and being on the World Wide Web, he must be rolling over in his grave. <laughs> if only we could kid him now. Thank you for letting me share his story. Best regards, David J. Hyslop III. Never being called such in regulations, the dog tag has forever imprinted itself on the serving individual's mind and the tag they wear. When my husband was doing the fictional st story on talking about the Civil Wars, that it's interesting that people, um, throughout the book I do do uh, fictional stories with um, history and and then the personal stories and I decided to do that format just to try to bring it into context that if you had not been there and might not think about what the dog tags are for or how important even they might be that um, it gives you a little bit of context also the thought that such a little small piece of metal could mean such a difference uh, getting stories from veterans, I found that they'd eventually say, you know, it, I can't think of a, a story about it. And within a few minutes, they were rattling off stories that they didn't even think they remembered about the dog tag, somebody hating it, somebody loving it, um, people wearing it forever, or, of course, being buried with it. So um, it, it's just something that we did differently um, in writing the book. So, if whether media goes along with me or not, let's just discuss the, the discuss this. Um, as late as the 1920s and 30s, um, as you can see, and if it does better in this format, if, of course, y'all be reading my words too. So that's. Um, 
the, America progressed into the Great Depression. It's important to note that the forming of the Social Security Act and how important it was during that time period for President Franklin D. Roosevelt, hoping to establish a Social Security board. But this board was eventually abolished and is replaced with what you now know, of course, as the Social Security Administration. One of the first tasks of the Social Security Administration was to record employers and their workers and to assign Social Security numbers. Now, this process is called enumeration and was highly contested by, very, uh, by a lot of people. William Randolph Hearst, a staunch opponent to President Roosevelt, used his ownership of and influence of uh, his thought process and of his idea with his newspapers to print negative press about the proposed tag that would identify workers as already being owned by the military and uh, being owned by the government and the government having all of your information. He was so very against that. While this tag was never issued by the administration and was only an idea of many suggested, the proposed tag, which is in the middle of the slide there, um, was used in his example and by the negative press of William Randolph Hearst. Hearst labeled the tag as a dog tag and suggested all workers would be treated and owned as dogs with private information lo no longer to be private. And it was in so many newspapers that then it was believed that soldiers, sailors, airmen began to pick it up and to call themselves and those little bits of tags, dog tags with that. This news was widespread. Okay. This news was widespread and easily caught on, like we said, and, and we believe that that is where dog tags in the label did stick. As America entered World War II, the Navy ID tag remained oval in shape, often called a tooth tag or wafer. Commander Frankie Jeffries of the U.S. Navy developed a technique in which a person's personal data would be inscribed on the wafer just like the ID tag. The information was typed onto onion skin paper, and then before the plate of the false teeth is completed, a carbon copy of the information is placed on it. A thumbprint by the same procedure was placed on the back. Does anyone here have that, or did they bring it with them? No? Have you, have you seen that besides the images here? The Marine Corps had square and oval shapes, and the Army instituted the oblong shape, shape, which can be seen today. The Navy and the Marine Corps had basically the same imp information imprinted on their tags. And I want you to know that I cannot tell you how many variations there are throughout the years of tags. And the few tags that you will see in this presenta presentation in no way covers all of the tags and their variations. These are just the majority of what we're given to our service members during the time period. Blood type was simplified during this time period as just A, B, and O. If you were positive, it listed as POS, P-O-S, and negative as N-E-G. But there was no R-H positive or negative yet. Religion was possible for all services, but the only choices given during this time period were C for Catholic, H for Hebrew, and P for Protestant. There were not options at this time for other religions, but you could leave it blank if the wearer chose to do so. This became an important option for the American Jewish wearer. It is understandable that one might fear their Nazi captors if Hebrew was imprinted on their dog tag. While the concept of placing so much information on the dog tag was thought to be helpful, this is an instance where life or death was decided upon because of too much information. Many U.S. Jewish soldiers were taken captive and separated from the other GIs because of their religion. In the New York Times, June 22, 1994, Victor B. Geller offers an explanation of the scarcity of Stars of David in D-Day cemeteries in Europe, that the families of fallen Jewish servicemen chose to have the remains shipped home for reburial rather than being buried overseas, but he actually believed there is a more likely explanation and connected to the dog tag. Many Jewish GIs omitted from their dog tags the indication that their religious identity was Jewish for the prudent reason that in the event of falling into German hands, their lives would be at greater risk if they were identifiable 
as Jewish. Technically, the ID tag is government property and not considered personal property. They are not removed from the remains during processing or transportation. Even today, though, it is not recovered by the government, but often treated as sentimental effects and given to the family. Graves registration companies were again assigned to units during World War II. They regularly collected, evaluated, identified, and supervised the remains of those killed during the war. Once again, they oversaw the selection of cemeteries and the collection of personal effect. ID tags were part of those personal effects. Hoping to identify and recover what remains they could from the Bataan Death March route, the Army's 601st Graves Registration Company faced a difficult mission. The road they walked on held the unidentified remains of Americans, English, Dutch, and Filipinos. It had been nearly four years and time had taken its toll. It takes ingenuity, determination, and sleuthing skills to work through such situations as presented to this company and most graves registration units. Regulations requiring identification tags to be worn were sometimes evaded. Tags were lost or in some instances destroyed by the manner of death. To this cause may be traced most of the unidentified burials where no tags were found Bodies were searched for other means of identification, such as letters, photographs, lockets, etc. The oblong style tag was issued by all services in the 1950s. The ID tags had other revisions in the year 1952 and in the mid-1960s. In 1952, there was an addition to the religion of the wearer, C for Catholic, J now instead of H for Hebrew, for Jewish, P for Protestant, X for for any other group, and why for prefers not to designate. In the mid-1960s, the notch was removed from the end of the tag opposite the hole, and the, te and the tetanus shot date was removed. It was also during these years that the serial number was replaced by the social security number of the individual. For those who carried a tag during the serial number period, it is one of the most remembered pieces of information. You can often ask a veteran who had a serial number when what theirs was, and they may not remember the date, but they may most often remember their serial number. The Vietnam War was a time period where changes were made to the information on dog tags. They were often associated with body bags and the dying, but it was during this time period that the wounded had a much better chance of getting medical help. The dog tags went from the earlier eight digits with their prefix to the current nine-day digit social security number. You could have both stamped on your tag if you wanted, but from this point on, the social security number was the main identifying number. The Marine Corps tag had a variety of additions, plus the date of their gas and size of their gas mask. They, too, added the full name of religions with many more to choose from than before. It is very common for the Marine Corps to put one of their tags on their boots, laced up with their shoelaces. Even with the slight variations, one could see how service members might have kept their older dog tags. Issuing units used a wider range of religions as designated. This picture above, with the gentleman asleep, was sent to me with the story included. During a noon break on an operation, I racked out in a hammock without a shirt. It was really hot. The sun shifted and I was no longer in the shade. When I came to, my chest had reddened and you could make out the tags and chain. One of my Cambodians shot a pic of me with my camera napping at the time. I still have the photo. It was after this time, Vietnam, the dog tag became a highly recognizable icon. Being used as a symbol for POW and MIAs, this icon represented more than its original meaning. It's, it continues to show itself in all aspects of our society with little acknowledgement of its actual personal connection by the majority of our nation. For example, the dog tag is exploded into a representation for everything from their original meaning for dogs to popular icons that lends itself to immediate recognition. The image or representation of this enduring symbol for military identification has found its way into the hearts of many who might not even understand the depth of its meaning, except for the basic connotation of identity. Because it is such a recognizable item, dog tags are used in the movie industry, in not so no well known, and in well known movies. We remember these images quite easily. 
Often the reality of the tag is blurred. Heroes, both real and represented as such, wear these tags. They are on movie stars and recording, ar recording artists. We have the famous from actual heroes, from heroes who became movie stars, and heroes who became politicians. They are represented in action figured and doll sets. <laughs> and here, if you can see, this is American Girl Collection. So um, she even has hers with her for Emily. They are in video games and cartoons. Let us look at this last image. If anyone was raised possibly going to elementary school in the 1950s, uh, this is a current poster. However, then you might have recalled Duck and Cover. And that was a part of the Cold War scare. Many school districts during this time period gave their students dog tags to wear in case there was an event or an attack where their bodies could be more easily identified by wearing their dog tags. We also have dog tags in everything from jewelry which I am wearing, to wine labels. Not actually imaged in the book, but I do discuss them, are what are called meat tags. Thank you. Oh. Still missing. Oh, right click. Thank you, sir. No. Now left click. Thank you. Okay. These tags are mirror images of a personal tag, and its tattoos are some of the most personal and amazing ways to display these tags. They are representative of their own dog tag, a family member's dog tag, or a fallen comrade's dog tag. It is because of those that have fallen that the dog tag is so often represented in memorials and statues. These are ones that have the dog tags as part of the memorial. And these are collected from, the, of course, the Vietnam Wall, and it is part of their traveling wall exhibition. And as you can see, the dog tags are stacked below all the bracelets on the, at the bottom of the table. Dog tags are also used as a focus as part of the memorial. and those that are its focus. At the University of Arizona, in the front of their Student Union Memorial Building is a memorial whose shape represents the battleship USS Arizona 18-foot ship's mast. The sculpture honors the 1,511 individuals assigned to the USS Arizona battleship on the day Pearl Harbor was bombed. The military dog tags allude to the rigging of the ship. The tags with the names of the 1177 fallen men are in the diamond shape of a god's eye, and the tags of the 334 survivors are above the tiled portion of the mass. It was the artist's intention to show the vast difference in the number of dead compared to the number of survivors. And another very touching and memorable display is Chicago's National Veterans Art Museum, Above and Beyond Memorial. The immense 10 by 40 foot sculpture is comprised of imprinted dog tags, one for each of the more than 58,000 servicemen and women who died in the Vietnam War. When one enters the mu museum, you hear something like wind chimes coming from above you and your attention is drawn upward 24 feet to the ceiling of the two-story high atrium. There are tens of thousands of metal dog tags, spaced evenly one inch apart, suspended from fine lines which allow them to move with the shifts in air currents. 
I am not sure that we can have anything in America that does not have some sort of urban, urban myth or legend associated to it, and the dog tag has its throngs of both. We've already discussed the most possible reason for the name having been assigned to the tag earlier, and I would like to share a few more with you. The first being, back in 1888, a scrungy little dog with wiry hair crept into the postal office in Albany, New York. None of the postmen noticed him curled up on a bag, sleeping soundly. He was lucky enough to remain in the building and slept soundly until the next morning when one of the postal clerks finally saw him in the corner on a bag of mail. They named him Oni with no story behind it. He had no tag to identify him and no one came forward to collect him. Oni made the postal service his new home and postal bags became his property. In the station or traveling on a train, Oni watched over the bags as they made their way to their destinations. Originally on a railway car between New York and Albany, his trips began to link lengthen until other postal clerks worried about Oni getting lost or stolen. This prompted the Albany office to get him a collar to identify him. Oni, Post Office, Albany, New York. Much like that of a baggage tag, this identified him in his home, but it did not keep him from becoming the mascot of all railway mail clerks. They fed him and made sure he was safe to travel on to other stations and guard the mail. An interesting fact for Oni is that as the mascot for all, he needed a tag from each of his stops. Thus in time, he gathered hundreds of tags on his collar, so many so that his collar almost weighed more than him, and there was no more room on the collar. The postmaster general at the time, John Wanamaker, had a dog jacket made for Oni where each of the tags could be sewn on the jacket and spread out the weight of all the tags collected. Oni was a legend in his own time. A lot of people believe that this is where we got the nickname of dog tags. So take it where you want, but that's one of the legends. Now probably the most incorrectly repeated myth about the dog tag is the notch in the dog tag. Some service members still believe the notch was part of the tag so that they could force it between the two front teeth and it would stay with the body. However, dental identification is too important for that to have been a reason. The notch was there because the embossing machine used in those days required it to hold the tag steady while being printed. The notch is not there today because a different machine is used to imprint the tag. During the Vietnam era, it was quite common to place one tag in your boot laces and one around your neck. Many people believe the boots will make it through anything, so if you tie one of your tags in the strings of the boot, you will be identified. The, item the items connected to a fallen comrade are of special significance to those they fight beside. Often, even with the most sincere of actions, there seems to be something about identification tags that make soldiers want to take them off their deceased comrade in the field. Whether it be for accountability purposes or whether they have watched too many John Wayne movies, I do not know, but once the ID tags have been removed from the remains, they are absolutely worthless, worthless for identifying purposes. What one must remember is the basic reason for wearing the dog tags. They are to be used for identification in case of death. Those two tags lying next to your chest are made and protected by those layers and most easily accessible for medical treatment and immediate burial. One tag stays with the body and one goes on a marker for temporal, temporary burial if necessary. If someone has to take the time to find a body part, time is lost. The next myth or legend is one with a group of soldiers with their own specific dog tag numbers. They were nicknamed the Moron Corps and known as Project 100,000 and now McNamara's 100,000. Unkind and definitely not politically correct, this name Moron Corps was given to a selected list of enlisted personnel. This group was given derogatory nickname by other soldiers, but it was billed as a great society program. These were a member of group of draftees who failed the minimum Armed Forces IQ test, but were enlisted anyway. I was not able to find an image of this dog tag or to actually speak with anyone that had one of these dog tags and was from this select group. 
Sometimes events happen that you cannot explain. And so let's think about this next legend and how some of its events are true. This is about the Hunley. While not the first submarine, the Hunley is the first recorded submarine to sink another ship. During the Civil War, the Hunley was a Confederate submersible that had a rough start. It had three different names, and the first two models sunk. The vessel was made to hold, was made to hold nine seamen, however. To think about nine grown men having to work and sail within her hull is a frightening scenario. Its own history and the fate of these brave men are interesting in itself, but there are two mysteries about this particular vessel that is important to personal identification. What has been recorded is the story of the gold coin and Lieutenant Dixon's luck of a bullock hitting the coin instead of piercing his leg at the Battle of Shiloh, 1862. He was a soldier who fought in that battle and then volunteered to be commander of the Hunley. It was through the careful sifting of his remains that the ring and the coin were found of his. The coin still having an indentation where the bullet hit it, and also the engraving of his words. Shiloh, April 6, 1862, my life preserver, GED. The second story being the finding of a Union soldier identification disc. Since it was a Confederate submersible, it held many a story of why such a disc would be on it. The man whose name is inscribed was on the list of deceased from the fight at Morris Island. Ezra Chamberlain enlisted in the Union Army in September 1861 and was assigned to the 7th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Carlson, who had Chamberlain's disc with him on the Hunley, was a privateer by trade, collecting and taking personal property for sale or trade. Once he was in the service of the Confederate Army, it is easily believable that he would have no qualms about taking something from the battlefield as a souvenir. It is recorded that he was at Fort Wagner, Morris Island, near Charleston, a few days before and after the battle where Ezra Chamberlain died in 1863, so it is likely he could have picked up his identification disc and kept it on him. It is the handling of deceased personnel that drives the importance of issuing and wearing these tags and having them stay with the body. In a book by Alan Clark, a veteran of Vietnam called, Oh God, I'm Dead, he makes a point of being unknown all too real. While in the Green Berets, he is on patrol from their camp in Doc To, looking across the Doc Poco River and hearing mortar rounds coming closer and closer to their position. As they were being fired upon, he was calling for fire to this certain spot. Get Puff the Magic Dragon here right away. Puff the Magic Dragon, a gunship aircraft whose mission was for life-saving close air support. He felt a thud and was knocked forward. He states, oh my God, my legs, my legs, help me. Oh God, I'm dead, he tells a sergeant. I'm here under an assumed name. Please make sure my wife knows if I die. Captain Clark lost both his legs because of this incident. He was fortunate not to lose his life, but his story resonates with the ultimate reasoning for the dog tags and having identification on you. While he was part of the Green Berets, their missions were often classified and dependent on their ability to be unknown. The reality of his condition made him realize the situation he faced and he wanted his wife to know what had happened to him. His real fear of being unknown is just as realistic as on today's battlefield. The first thing we want to look at is one of the new versions of what we might have for what we call a personal information carrier. It was developed to hold 20 years of medical records and images taken during this time. Slightly smaller than the size of a dog tag, it can keep a person's medical benefits, excuse me, medical records without the bulk of medical rec records. Researchers found that soldiers did not always keep the PIC with their dog tags, and finding the PIC on the body became an issue. Medical personnel had to search pockets, backpacks, or go through several layers of clothing trying to find it. They also failed, they also found that it failed under certain environments and conditions. So solving this issue was a priority and it played a key role in developing the most recent item, the Joint Electric Information Carrier. 
The technology has advanced, but the EIC must still be carried by the individual in the field. And I want to make it clear that this is not a standardized item that is issued. All are still in the test phase. We are not alone in our wanting to be committed and precise in properly identifying our service members. Many countries have used some sort of identification throughout their years, and their personal stories are just as important as others. While the tag itself can look different depending on the country, the personal story shared with me, as I said, and the sentimentality of those do still remain true. As individuals, we assign value to things, especially items that have been part of our personal belongings. The value is not monetary, it is emotional, and however, it is the emotional aspect that makes it invaluable. We collect things because they remind us of something important to us, or we find it and have comfort in knowing it is around us. It fills a void or a need. This is the value of the dog tag in our most recent history. And as we wind this up, I'd like to share a few of the personal stories shared with me. One is from the gentleman that has this collection that I'm showing you some of his items right now. His name is Dick Clayton, and he is a collector of militaria. And one day he was going through an antique shop and noticed a ID bracelet connected to a dog tag. And so he asked to see it out of the glass case and picked it up and looked at it and was astonished to find that it was the name of the gentleman who had raised him for about 10 years when he was a young boy. Now, he went ahead and purchased it for about $30, then called the family that he um, knew very much as his own family, and they had no idea how someone else had gotten this, but they wanted him to keep it since he felt such a special connection to it and that he had found it. And sometimes these stories are such treasures that there's no way you cannot share them and that we cannot look at the variety of emotions that are expressed within them. Here we have a picture of Elsie Robbins. This was sent to me by her great nephew in a collection that he has and that he wanted to share with me. She's a small town Indiana girl who never went beyond the eighth grade. She went to nursing school and then joined in 1970 the Army Nurse Corps in France. She served her years throughout the service, but while she was on Corregidor, she started to go deaf. As she lost her hearing, she taught herself to read lips. It wasn't until she was transferred to night duty that the Army discovered she couldn't hear. On night duty, she had to shine a light in soldiers' faces to read their lips. After complaints from the soldiers about the night nurse shining the flashlight in their faces, she was questioned by her commander. She confessed that she had been deaf for quite a while, but did not want to leave the Army. She was discharged from the Philippines by Douglas MacArthur, who was general governor at the time, and officially retired from the Army in 1933 as a lieutenant. Here's one from another gentleman. I'm sure you're not lacking for stories about dog tags with the letter H on them, and it hardly fits into the concept you mentioned of a dog tag bringing comfort to a soldier but you might be interested in this story. Bob Levine was a veteran of the 90th Infantry Division who was wounded and captured on Hill 122 in Normandy. Levine's leg was amputated by a German soldier, and for many years Bob wondered if the doctor had cut off his leg because of that H on his dog tag. Many years later, in the pocket of his uniform jacket, which he had kept, he discovered a note from the German doctor explaining that the amputation was necessary. Bob went to Normandy on the 40th anniversary, and because of the note was signed, he was able to locate the family of the surgeon who had since passed away. The daughter of the surgeon came to America, was a friend of Bob's, and when Bob was head of the New Jersey chapter of the American XPOWs, she visited him and spoke at one of their chapter events. LaVon T. McDaniel. I was a faithful wearer of my dog tags, the same set of dog tags I made for myself in 1943 I wore through all my years of the service. 
We were given new tags when we went to Korea in my unit, Charlie Company, 23rd Infantry, 2nd Infantry Division, when we were called to go. The identifying eye in the dog tag was once again prepared for each departing soldier, and I left my original ones home with me. Following about a month of combat, my unit was almost annihilated on the 31st day of August. I was wounded and captured on the 1st of September. During the first few hours, my dog tags, amongst many main items, were taken from me, and for many years I have harbored the thought that some Korean native would find them and they would return to me. No luck so far. John Huber. This was sent to me by a lady by the name of Tana Tony Ferris. My dog, Trubel, found a piece of rock with a set of dog tags embedded in it with some other personal items. My first thought was that this sailor had perished at sea and I held his last farewell to this world in my hand. All I could think of was how much I wanted to return this brave soldier's dog tags to his family. Through years of searching for him, she finally found him in 19... Ooh, excuse me, he was in Southern California in 1969, and she had found this 34 years later. The story that he tells her is much less dramatic than she was expecting because it was, he was on a date, he was in a canoe, and they were making out, <laughs> and he lost his billfold and his dog tags and a few other personal items, and then Mother Nature took over from that. But it was amazing that her dog, Trubel, found that. Now, a much more poignant and um, touching story from recent. I received the photos of this gentleman and a questionnaire um, that they had done before the young man uh, left for Iraq. And David Bence had filled it out with his sister and mother and then went to Iraq. He also gave a copy of his dog tags to his sister to wear. Within two weeks of being in Iraq, he was killed. They had not given me their questionnaire, questionnaire yet, and the mother said that she wanted to immediately share it with me, that she could not speak with me about it, and the sister could not speak with me about it, but they wanted to make sure that I knew that she will wear his dog tags for the rest of her life, and every time she hears that jingle, Every time she feels them on the chest, she will be thinking of her brother. We also have another one of Ken Ballard. This is sent to me from his mother, Karen, excuse me, Karen Meredith. On May 29, 2004, I was living with what I thought was an ordinary life. On May 30, 2004, Ken was killed in a war in Iraq. While many people say that casualties so far have been relatively no, low, any number more than zero was too many for this war. On that day, my life changed. I speak for myself, no one else. Very few people have ever actually met a Gold Star mom. It is important that people know what it feels like to be in my situation. When my son's body was returned to me, they gave me what was on his body when he was killed, his belt buckle, his spurs, Calvary and his dog tags. I immediately put them on and have not removed them for anything. Not for airport security, not for a mammogram. They stay close to my heart where my son will always be. There's a group called the Patriot Guard Riders and their mission is to come to each of active duty services to protect and keep anyone that might disrupt those services away from the active duty member's family so they can be protected. And they are very loved by our military services and their family members. And each of the services that they go to, that Patriot Guard rider has a dog tag of the service they went to. So as you can see here, this um, particular member how many dog tags he has and how many um, funerals he has been to. This is actually from a very good friend of mine and of her father and all of his family members and she writes very a very sweet story about him about when he got Alzheimer's they couldn't find anything that would help him remember where he was from, what his name was, but he could remember 
his number. And so like we talked about earlier, that if you could remember what your number was on your dog tag before it became even your social security number, you remember that serial number. So they had a dog tag made with his serial number, and from then on, that's what he would show when he couldn't remember his own name. He remembered he wore his dog tags, and he was buried with his set of dog tags. For so many people, this small item stands for those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. This fallen soldier display that is so well known to our military forces and family members is a loving tribute and a visual reminder of the fallen soldiers. Having a historical significance from World War II, the items were displayed as a visual marker for units coming behind other ones to know where the fallen had been temporarily interred. The rifle's firing pin was removed and the rifle was turned upside down and stuck in the ground with the helmet placed on top of the rifle. This allowed the units following them to easily find and take care of the fallen soldiers. The dog tags were not to be removed from the body, but the fallen soldier display today is presented with boots, rifle, helmet, and the dog tags are laid on the rifle, as you can see them hanging here. It is the dog tags that one touches as they approach the display. Throughout the years, all services have made hundreds of changes, but its intent and important connection to identity has not. Understanding the sentimental, sentiment, sentimentality of these small metal tags is human, and we must remember our, what we must remember are the names and the stories of those who have served and continue to serve. Once again, I am grateful to share the history, personal stories, and folk culture of the dog tag. The value of carrying on traditions and sharing our personal stories individualizes America and creates a bond of identity for future generations. I thank you all very much, and if anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer anything if I can. Thank you all very much. Are there any questions? You listed, Debbie, you listed other countries yes. who also use dog tags. Is the term dog tag transferred to any other country? No, they, they use it as identification tags or disks. And were, was the U.S. the first to do this, or was no, other countries do it earlier? Other countries did it earlier. Right, and they had it. They also had, um, in many countries still, they have one metal one and may, maybe one paperboard one. Um, and it, it is used for different reasons. But we were not the first, but we did, um, we do have the two metal tags, and now ours are very distinct. I have one more question. Oh, good. I'm so uh, glad. Uh, I'm always searching for the first citation. When was the term dog tag used for these identification tags? Uh, in the military, uh, officially? Well, anywhere. In, in other words, the term dog tag appears for the first time somewhere. And w Perfect. William Randolph Hearst did it, and he's the first one to have it in print, actually, but it was for the Social Security Administration's um, tag. And well, the... It was not for the military, and the military still does not call it a dog tag. It is still an identification tag. I would love to have a citation of when it was first in print. That's a great idea, the, uh, and I, I should have done that. That's, thank you, sir. No, I appreciate that. that that's wonderful. It would, it would be nice to have that. Well, James, yeah, on behalf you. of the American Folk Life Center and the Veterans History Project, thank you. Thank you. And we have yeah. something for you. Your oh, own. yay! It's your own Veterans History oh, Project. So Thank you. I will add it to my collection. Thank you very Thanks much. Very I can much. jingle more. Yes, you can. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.